Gracias, Señor, por el privilegio de saber que hemos sido creados a tu imagen. Cuán maravillosas son tus obras, Señor. No podemos comprenderlo, pero nos alegramos. Nos alegramos sabiendo que nos has amado, nos has formado con cuidado, nos has diseñado para tu gloria. Qué alegría saber que tenemos un propósito, que tenemos un creador, un hacedor que nos ama. Y no solo eso, que también nos ha salvado porque hemos entendido también que esa imagen que has puesto en nosotros ha sido quebrantada por nuestro pecado, ha sido dañada. Y nos duele en nuestro corazón, Señor, saber eso, que ese pecado nos ha apartado de ti, nos ha alejado de lo que fuimos creados para ser, nos ha alejado del propósito que tenemos, glorificarte, Señor, y ahora vivimos perdidos, extraviados en nuestro pecado. Pero gracias, Señor, por no dejar así las cosas. Tú estás restaurando tu imagen en nosotros y todo esto es posible gracias a Jesús, a su perfecto sacrificio en la cruz. Porque en Él fue cargada toda nuestra iniquidad, toda nuestra maldad y Él nos vistió de su justicia y ahora tenemos un nuevo corazón. Nos gozamos, Señor, en saber que tenemos ese nuevo corazón que está siendo restaurado cada vez más a tu imagen. Ayúdanos, Señor, en este tiempo a comprender mejor cómo nos has diseñado, a entender mejor cuál es la vida que nos llamas a vivir para poder reflejar tu gloria en este mundo quebrantado. Enséñanos, Señor, llénanos de sabiduría y de entendimiento para la gloria de tu nombre. En Jesús oramos. Amén. All right, the most critical foundations have now been laid for us, I hope faithfully from God's word, for us to now stand on them and think together through all kinds of issues that touch on our humanity in this world. But before we do that, I want us to do a bit more biblical meditation. So this time with Psalm chapter eight. So if you could turn back to the beginning of your study guide. So right after Genesis one, there was Psalm eight. And I want us to do the same thing we did with Genesis 1 with Psalm 8. I want to give you just a few moments right now to meditate on this chapter. Just you, with God, His Spirit, read this chapter slowly, circle words or phrases that stick out to you, think about what it means. And again, if you have time, maybe summarize this passage, it's a whole chapter of the Bible, with one sentence. How would you put in one sentence what God is saying through his spirit in Psalm 8? Just spend the next few minutes with this passage between you and God. Let me pray again for us. Uh, God, we want to hear from you what you say about us. And so we ask you to open our eyes and our minds Help us to understand you, your word, and what your word says about us in Psalm chapter 8, right now, in all the places where we are. Lead us, direct us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, let's come back together from meditating on God's word. Is this not a great psalm? Well, let's just dive in together a bit into it. Did you notice anything that Psalm 8 repeats that might clue us into its meaning? It's the first and last verse, right? Verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's the first verse and it's the last verse. From beginning to end, that seems to be the main point of the psalm. So let's just camp out on that verse for a minute. When it says, O Lord, our Lord, did you notice anything unusual there about those two words, Lord? Like the first time you see capital L, small caps, O-R-D, the second time you see capital L, then lowercase O-R-D, so they're spelled different. And this is where it's helpful to remember, every time we see Lord with the small caps O-R-D, translated in the language with the, that capital L, then the small caps language, that's Yahweh in the original language of the Old Testament, which is the name by which God revealed himself to his people when he was delivering them out of slavery in Egypt. So that's the name for God that's translated with a capital L, then small caps, O-R-D. But then the second time you see it, it's lowercase O-R-D. And whenever you see Lord like that in the Old Testament, it's usually the word Adonai. So not Yahweh, but Adonai, which is more like a title for God, kind of like king. The word Lord Adonai literally means the sovereign one. So if you were to put them together, you were to think of a king, it'd be like, King Edward. Edward would be his name. King would be his title. So the picture here is the psalmist saying, O Yahweh, Lord, the Lord, the King, who was and is and is to come, who has power over all things. And then he says in the middle, you are our Lord. So there's personal relationship there. You're not just the Lord. You're our Lord, our King. Like just those Four words, O Lord, our Lord, lead us to pause and worship. O God, you are Yahweh. You are the one who was and is and is to come. And throughout history, you have seen people in their suffering and by your power, you have been their help. Not just their help, our help, the helper of all who trust in you. You are our Lord, you're my Lord. Yahweh, Lord over history, you're my King. And you are majestic. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, put this together. The God whose majesty is over all the earth is our God. He's my God. And we are, even right now, meeting with him, listening to him speak to us through his word. And we are praying just like Jesus taught us to pray at this point. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your what? Your name in all the earth. Oh, the Bible just leads us to worship. And then we keep going. The psalm says, you have set your glory above the heavens. So God's glory is above the heavens, beyond what we can see or imagine. But did you notice that this word glory is also repeated in the psalm? You jump down to verse 5 and you see glory again. You have made him a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with what? Glory and honor. So you might circle glory in both those places. Let's just hold that in our minds. And we'll come back to it in a minute when we get to verse five, but God's glory repeated twice here. Come back to verse two. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So I'll just mention briefly, there's a lot of difficulty in understanding this particular verse and a few different ideas among biblical scholars about how it fits into the overall point of the psalm. But instead of getting caught up in what's unclear, let's think about what is clear. Like what do we know we can learn from this verse? Well, one, God's strength. See this picture of strength there and his power are evident in the mouths of babies and infants. So even little Babies who can do nothing but babble are in some sense a picture of God's strength and power. And anybody who's seen a baby be born, the miracle of birth, knows it is a picture of the power of the God who formed that baby in a mother's womb. It's amazing. And then another thing that's clear in this verse is that God has foes. He has enemies who oppose God. And this verse says, they will be stilled. 
So these things we know, God's strength and power are evident in babies and infants and God's enemies will be stilled. Something the picture here is how the strength and power of God evident in something so simple as a little baby is greater than the strength and the power that God's enemies could ever portray in all their might. But let's keep moving on and see if we get more clues into what this means. So verse three says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your hand, the work of your fingers, which you have set in place, the moon and stars, so let's think about that verse. When I look at your heavens, like what she describes as the moon and the stars, I realize that they are the work of your fingers. They're like your artwork. Like, let me show you my artwork here on the screen. So I'll tell you what I can draw. Like there's a stick figure, there is a, I can draw a house, the door, of course, at this point, I realize the stick figure is just as big as the house. I can draw a sun. Like that, that's, that's my artwork. That's what I can do. And I know there are many of you who can do better than that. But let me show you what God can do. This is the work of God's fingers. He set every single one of those stars in place. Like scientists tell us, there are about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And our galaxy is one of about a million galaxies that we can see with our best telescopes. Each one of them filled with billions upon billions of other stars. And Isaiah 40 says, God brings out the starry host one by one and he calls them each by name. <laughs> by name. Like, there's a uh, Bob. Or there's Mary up there. Or there's... Z one four three six nine er. I don't know. I don't know what their names are, but our God knows all their names. He has set them in place. Does this not just lead us to worship, to praise God? When I look at your fingers, your heavens, what they create, you have set them in place. I see the repetition there in verse two. The heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, what you've set in place, your artwork, and then. So now we get to verse four, and we feel the wonder of this in a whole new way. In light of your glory and and above the heavens, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Now, this makes sense to all of us, doesn't it? Like when you see scenes like those stars over the mountains, you don't stand underneath the night sky and, and you feel and, and just feel like, uh, like you're big and everything around you is small. You feel the opposite. You start thinking, like, who am I? Think about a world with seven billion people in it and billions and billions of stars and the universe, it's so vast, it's so big. You just start to feel small. Like, you feel, you don't stand under those stars and think, I feel so big right now. You're like, I feel so tiny, so small, so even insignificant. But this is where we see the wonder of the psalm because the conclusion here is not the heavens are so majestic, which makes me so insignificant. No, the conclusion in this psalm is actually the opposite. What is man, verse four says, that you, God, are mindful of him. A you, the God who made all this. It's all the work of your fingers. It all belongs to you. And you are mindful of me? <laughs> like this, the son of man, which is another way of saying mankind. And obviously a picture, just a reference to humanity here, that you, oh God, are mindful of us, that you, oh God, care for us. And this is what blows the psalmist away, not ultimately the heavens, the work of God's fingers, as astounding as that is, what's astonishing is that this God is mindful of humanity. Like men and women made in God's image are what's on God's mind. He's mindful of them. You and I are what's on God's mind. God is always thinking about us, about you and me. And not just thinking about us, mindful, he cares for us. He's concerned for us such that he provides for us. So the picture is, what is the psalm teaching about who God is? He's majestic over all the earth. His glory is above the heavens. The work of his fingers is all over the heavens. And in all his glory, he thinks about you and me. And he desires to care for you and me. This is astounding. 
And it gets even more astounding when you get to verse five. Yet you have made him a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Now we won't spend a ton of time here on heavenly beings because there's some debate about what that's a reference to. Is God a heavenly being? Well, yes, but there's only one of him. Are angels heavenly beings? Yes, we know this is a picture of you and me, mankind, humanity made just a little lower than the angels or even God himself, which sounds like an overstatement until you read the next phrase, you have crowned him with glory. And there it is, the same word we saw back in verse one when the psalmist said, you have set your glory above the heavens. So God's glory is above the heavens, but now we see that his glory is also on earth, in man, in you and me. And this is truly, it's breathtaking, it's life changing. Do you wanna see the glory of God on display? Yes, go outside at night, look up at the stars and stand in awe. But you know what's even easier? Look at the person sitting next to you right now. They are God's glory on display. Look at the people in your family. Look at the people at your work. Look at the people in the store, at the restaurant, at the gas station, at the gym. They are God's glory on display. The Bible teaches that God has made men and women in his image as a reflection of his glory, which is why I say that truth like this is life-changing. Because when you realize all people are made in God's image, crowned with glory and honor, then Racism is detestable to you. Now you work to honor all people no matter what they look like, no matter where they've immigrated from. Now abortion is abhorrent to you because a little baby in a mother's womb is crowned with glory and honor. Now injustice of all kinds is intolerable to you because you actually believe that every person around you and every person in the world is crowned with glory and honor and it totally changes the way you live. This is why we're about to dive into all sorts of issues in the world flowing from these truths in God's word. And so please, please don't miss this. This should not just the way you change the way you think about other people. This is where things get even more breathtaking and life-changing. You wanna see the glory of God on display? Look in the mirror and realize that you are crowned with glory and honor by God himself. That God, the God of the universe, is mindful of you. That God cares for you. That God has crowned you with glory and honor. You do not need this man or this woman, this person or that person, to accept or acknowledge you in this way or that because you are crowned with glory and honor by God. Contrary to what science or technology would try to tell us today, we're not created a little higher than animals or machines. We're created a little lower than angels, a little lower than God himself. And in this way, we have inherent glory and honor. And responsibility, verse six goes on to say, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. So we see that word dominion again. You've put all things under his feet, sheep and oxen, birds of the fields, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens, fish of the sea, whatever pass along the paths of the sea. We've already seen this in Genesis one. God has entrusted responsibility in this world to divine image bearers, you and me, to live and lead in such a way that we display his glory and honor in the world around us. God has given us responsibility to reflect his goodness and his honor and his love and his justice, his character, his glory, in the world around us. You and I are called to reflect the character of God to all creation around us. Verse seven and eight, then back around to verse nine. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We reflect the character of God so that through our lives, as men and women crowned with glory and honor by God, might reflect his majesty his love, his justice, his glory in all the earth. And that leads us right back into the next part of our notes. So now jump back in that study guide to where we left off, where we still have one part left in our answer to the question, how can I, we experience the good life as human beings in this world. So I didn't stop there just because it was time. It was definitely time, but I also stopped there because the last part of our answer to this question leads us directly into all the other topics we're gonna look at tonight. So remember where we left off. All who follow Jesus are being conformed into the image of Jesus in a gradual process of transformation that will one day be complete in heaven. And that will be the perfectly good life. But as long as we remain in this world, the good life now involves doing and promoting justice and righteousness as a reflection of the God in whose image we are made. Now, think about that statement in light of all we've seen so far, the foundations upon which we're standing concerning humanity. Remember the three R's. As men and women made in God's image, we resemble him, 
For those who are in Christ, we're going to resemble him. We're growing to resemble him more and more and more. We're in relationship with God, and we've been given the responsibility to represent God in this world. We've seen this picture of dominion and subduing and ruling now in Genesis 1 and Psalm 8 in a way that reflects the character of God. So it's no surprise then to see God say to his people in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So there it is. You see it? The good life, according to God. And not just the good life for us, yes, for us, but also for others, for humanity in general. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. Now, we could easily do a whole secret church on like this verse right now. Maybe we will one day. But for now, let me give you a biblical flyover of justice. And by flyover, I mean we're going to hit a lot of biblical truth really, really, really fast. So here's my best attempt at a biblical definition of justice. Justice is that which is right for all people as exemplified in the character of God and expressed in the word of God. So justice is used hundreds of times in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it's often accompanied by the word righteousness. And the focus is on that which is right for all people, including the poor, the oppressed, the sojourner, the widow, the orphan, the afflicted, the hungry, the needy, as exemplified in God's character. So God loves and cares and provides for all people and especially those groups of people. And expressed in his word, his law communicates what is right for all people. So justice is that which is right for all people as exemplified in God's character and expressed in God's word. So much more we can unpack there, but we're moving ahead. As a result of sin, injustice abounds in humanity. Injustice is the opposite of justice. It's that which is not right for all people as exemplified in God's character and expressed in God's word. In our sinfulness, we as humans individually and collectively harm and hurt and oppress and we don't do justice. And God holds his people accountable for injustice, specifically in places like Jeremiah 22 and Matthew 23 and so many others. In the words we already read from Micah 6, God requires us to do justice. That requirement leads us straight to Jesus because the gospel of Jesus Christ is our only hope for ultimate justice. You think about the biblical definition of justice, that which is right for all people, as exemplified in God's character and expressed in God's word. Well, Jesus perfectly reveals the character of God and Jesus perfectly fulfills the word of God. And in this way, Jesus perfectly demonstrates the justice of God, which is why prophecy about his coming in Isaiah 9 talks about how he'll establish his kingdom, uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. John 5 makes clear Jesus is the just judge of the world and he came to proclaim justice to people in all nations to proclaim that which is right for all humanity knowing all humanity was sinful which is why he came to endure the judgment that people from all nations deserve he was unjustly treated in the words of Isaiah 53 by oppression and judgment or injustice he was taken away and he endured the injustice of man and the judgment of God to sin on the cross what we've talked about for the whole world 1 John 2 says as we've seen came to die on the cross for sinners so that anyone from any nation may be justified before God by grace through faith in him. This is one of the greatest paragraphs in all the Bible in your notes there, Romans 3. We are justified before God by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. God forgives us of our sin, fills us with his spirit, as we've already seen in such a way that, now follow this, justification by faith before God now leads to works by faith that glorify God, including efforts to do justice. That's the clear message of James in the Bible. What good is it, brothers, if you claim to have faith, but you have no work? You don't do anything for people in need. Your faith is worthless. It's empty. It's hollow. It's not true faith. True faith leads to works. To go back to Jesus' statement on the two greatest commandments, to love God with all our hearts, and we love others as ourselves. And this is part of the process of becoming more and more like Jesus in his image. The more we become like Jesus, the more we will do justice. The more we'll love God with all our hearts, love others as ourselves, and do what's right for people. So how does that play out practically? In a million ways, I'll list some of them biblically here. We do justice by proclaiming the gospel among all people. It is right for us to proclaim the gospel among all people in all nations. See, last year's secret church, the greatest injustice in the world is that over three billion people have never heard the gospel and we're sitting back with the gospel, practically turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to them. That is not right. We do justice by proclaiming the gospel among all people. We do justice by doing and teaching others to obey everything Christ has commanded us. Think about all the ways Jesus and his word commands us to do that which is right for others. And here's a fire hose of ways that we can do justice along these lines. We model and teach justice and mercy in our families, Deuteronomy 4. We work hard and honestly at our jobs that contribute to the good of society, enable us to share our resources with others, 1 Thessalonians 3, Ephesians 4. We give generously and sacrificially of our resources to people in need, 1 Timothy 6. We steward advantages we have for the sake of the disadvantage, 2 Corinthians 
Corinthians 8. We use any leadership, authority, or influence we have to serve others, just like Jesus did. Mark chapter 10, we care for widows, orphans, sojourners. This is how we do justice, what God has required of us. We do justice by understanding the needs and defending the rights of the poor. Proverbs 29 and 31. We correct oppression, do good, seek justice, correct oppression. Isaiah 1, 17. We refuse to show partiality, specifically to the rich, over the poor. James 2. We honor, pray for, and subject ourselves to government leaders under God. That's right and just before God. Romans 13, 1 Peter 2 tell us. I could keep going on and on with other commands like this in Scripture, but again, I think that's a whole other secret church. To summarize here, we live to do righteousness at all times. Psalm 106, 3. Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. And we don't do, just do justice individually. That's another place we could spend a lot more time. But to the extent that we're able and have opportunity according to God's leadership in our lives, we promote justice in the world around us. I put the picture of the just king in Psalm 72 there as a picture of what we long and work for in the world around us with the responsibility God has given us as humanity to represent him and rule like him with justice and righteousness that reflects him as imitators of him, Ephesians 5, in this fallen world ultimately longing for the day when Jesus, the just judge, returns and his justice reigns on the earth. In this fallen world, we find ourselves asking, how long? How long will injustice reign? How long will wars continue to be waged? How long will sin and evil be exalted in so many ways? Our Father in heaven, bring your kingdom here. In the words of the martyrs in Revelation 6, how long before you judge this earth? And we're told to wait as more injustice continues, as more Christians even are unjustly killed in Revelation 6, as we think about persecuted church, the biblical reality is clear. As long as sin remains in this world, it will not be perfectly just. So what do we do? We pray for injustice to end. We pray for God's kingdom to come and we live to hasten his coming. That's the language from 2 Peter 3. As we wait, we live lives of holiness and godliness that hasten the coming of the day of God, continually crying out, come Lord Jesus, Revelation 22. Now, here's why the last part of this answer to our question, how can things be made right and how can I, we experience the good life is so important. Follow this, put it all together. Jesus has not just made it possible for us and our humanity to be forgiven of our sin and filled with the spirit and transformed into his image. Yes, yes, yes to all of that. But if that was the whole story, then, well, Jesus could take you or me to heaven right now and everything would be great. Salvation, glorification complete. But that's not what he's done. Yet, at least not with any of us, he's left us here in this time and in this place with great commandments to love God with everything we have while we're here and to love others around us and around the world as ourselves, which leads to a great commission to go and make disciples of all the nations to lead more and more people to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And in all of this to do that which is good and right and just and merciful for other human beings. From Genesis 1 to Psalm 8 to the rest of scripture, it's clear. God has left us here in this world for now, in this time in humanity, with a responsibility to rule, with dominion to rule justly and mercifully for the good of humanity all around us, for the good of other image bearers all around us, over seven billion of them to be precise. So in a world of sexual confusion and abortion and ethnic discrimination and racism and reproductive technologies and gene editing and digital media and artificial intelligence. What is good? What's right for people as exemplified in God's character and expressed in God's word? How does what we've seen in God's word about humanity now apply to all of these issues at the forefront of humanity in this world? And that's what I wanna do in the rest of our time tonight. Certainly, to do a, certainly not to do an exhaustive examination of all these issues, but to hopefully get us thinking, how does what the Bible teaches about humanity affect the way we begin to think about these things? If I could just give you this picture. Imagine I was holding a diamond right now that represent, re represents all that God's word teaches about humanity. So over the rest of our time tonight, I just wanna shine that diamond for a few moments with light reflecting off of it on the issue of sexuality. And then I wanna give you a, minute, a few minutes to reflect on that. And then I wanna shine that diamond and light off of it on the issue of abortion and racism and reproductive technology and social media and so on. And just trust that God through his word and by his spirit will make us more like Jesus, even right now in this time and this place with these issues before us. So let's start with humanity and sexuality. Again, not in an exhaustive way, like we did it even in a previous secret church. But I hope in a helpful way as we begin to think about the sexual confusion around us and in us in our culture today. 
And there are some senses in which we're living in unique days. At the same time, you look at a place like Corinth in the first century, when the Bible was being written, this was a time and a place that was known for rampant sexual immorality and confusion and deception. Corinth was a culture where anything goes, indulge your body however you desire. And God speaks into that situation. And I want us to read what he says about our bodies being made in his image there. So before we look at these truths in your notes, jump down to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. And let's just, let's hear straight from God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be nominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do not know that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute? Never. We do not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her. For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Okay, let's, let's, let's stop there. What do we learn here about humanity and sexuality? Well, first and foremost, we, we learn that your body was created by God for his glory and for your earthly and eternal good. So it was apparently a common phrase in that day when 1 Corinthians 6 was being written to say food for the stomach and the stomach for food. In other words, the food was made for the stomach and the stomach is made for food. When people used that phrase in Corinth, the implication was the body was made for sexual activity. Sexual activity was made for the body. But God is saying, no, the body is made for the Lord, for God. And the Lord, God, is for the body. Think about that statement. Think about both sides of what God's saying here. First, that the body is for the Lord, for God. Like that is a very different starting point than every other message we hear in this world. And every way we're prone to think about our bodies. We are so driven today by whatever can bring our bodies the most pleasure. What can we see, touch, do, eat, listen to, engage in? We're drowning in a culture that shouts at every turn, please your body. And the Bible's saying at every turn, please God with your body. So you're gonna please your body or please God? And that's a fundamental question, maybe the fundamental question, because this question is at the root of every other question we might ask when it comes to sexuality. The fundamental starting place is asking, what is our ultimate aim? Are we living for self-gratification in our bodies? Or are we living for God-glorification in our bodies? Because God is saying, your body is not ultimately for you, your body is ultimately for me. And so follow this, don't miss this, is the next part of this phrase where God says, your body is for me and I am for you. God says, I, the Lord, am for your body. So the Bible's not just saying your body's for God, so do what he says and make your body miserable, but it doesn't matter because it's not about you, it's all about him. No, the Bible's saying your body is for God and God is for your body. God, feel this right where you're sitting, he's for your body. Just like we've seen, your body has been created, formed, fashioned by God himself in his image. Genesis 1, 27 says, for his glory and for your good on this earth. God is not against your body. God is not even indifferent towards your body, which is really important because there's a lot of these Christians in Corinth who were thinking, just like many of us are tempted to think today, God cares about my spiritual life, but he doesn't care about my physical life which is not true because as we've already seen, God is for all of you, spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, all of who you are. This truth is so vital and fundamental because if you don't believe this, that God is for your body, then you will buy into all kinds of lies from the adversary about your body. You will question if God knew what he was doing when he made you with this disability or that desire. You will question if God knew what he was doing when he made you as a male or a female. You will question why God would say, don't do this with your body, and you will justify going against what God says, because at the root, we're wondering if God is against us instead of being for us. But he is for us. We've seen this. God, the all-wise, all-loving creator of the universe is the one who formed your body and my body, and God knows better than any one of us what is best for our bodies. Yeah, we live in a world where the mantra is, nobody can tell me what to do with my body. And think about it, see it, that kind of thinking is the essence of sin to say to God, I know better than you how this body is to be used. Oh, don't say that to the God who is for your body, who is for you. God is 
for you. Hear this, believe this, receive this. this is where it all starts. And if you question this, if you don't believe this, you will live in all kinds of confusion and deception. Don't do it. Believe and receive this truth. The God who formed you is for you. God knows the way to satisfy not just your soul, but your body. You want to know how much he's for you, specifically for your body? Look at verse 14. God has made an eternal investment in your body. Verse 14 says, God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead and will also raise us by his power. This is talking about God raising Jesus' body from the dead and God raising our bodies from the dead. And that's what I mean by your body was created by God for his glory and your earthly and eternal good. This is revolutionary. God doesn't just love you enough to save your soul. God loves you so much that he wants to redeem your body, to restore and raise up your body for all of eternity. This is what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about, which I included in your notes there. The whole argument of many of the Christian, Corinthian Christians was we'll fulfill the body's pleasures in life, which is temporary, and then our souls will go on to eternal life. So we'll have the best of both worlds. Does that sound familiar? How common is this? Even in the church today, we've created a whole version of Christianity where we see our souls as sealed in heaven, but we go on living for the temporary pleasures of our bodies however we want in this world. And we're okay with it as long as we'll get to heaven. But that's not Christianity. That goes totally against the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, listen, I'm laying down my body. He says, I'm dying every day and I'm missing out on a lot in this world because I believe that God is for me and I know that one day he's gonna raise up this body just like he did with Jesus. Now listen to this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, but hold, I tell you, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you follow that? God in his power raised the body of Jesus from a tomb. One day he's going to raise the bodies of all who trust in Jesus from the grave through the same power. So you put all this together. Think about this. If your body has this identity, you've been molded personally by the hands of the creator God who loves you so much. And if your body has this destiny to thrive forever in a perfectly redeemed state, then why would we trust ourselves or anyone else in this world more than God with our bodies? Your body is created by God, for God, and for your good, now and forever. The problem is we doubt or reject this, which leads to this second truth. In this broken world, we all have broken bodies. And this goes all the way back to what we've already seen in Genesis 3, right? We read it earlier. The first sin in the world started with man and woman using their bodies outside of God's, God's good design for their bodies. God had said, do not do what from a particular tree? Do not eat. Don't satisfy the physical craving of your body in this way. Oh, this is so significant. Pay close attention here. God had created them with a physical desire for food, which was good. But that physical desire could lead them to fulfill that desire outside of God's design, which was not good. So God tells them, here's the good way to fulfill your physical desires. Eat from, enjoy all these trees. Here's a harmful way to fulfill your physical desires. Don't eat from this tree. So from the very beginning of the Bible, before sin even entered the world, God gave man and woman physical desires that were not intended to be fulfilled in certain ways. And what happens in Genesis 3 is man and woman decide to fulfill those desires in ways contrary to God's word, contrary to God's good design for their bodies, and the result was brokenness. Brokenness between man and woman and God and each other and the world around them in ways that would not just affect them, but every single person who would come after them. We live in a world that has been broken by sin, and this brokenness affects all of us, in all kinds of ways, not all in the same ways. Let me just list some of the ways our bodies are broken in this world. Like fundamentally, we live in a world of disability and weakness in our bodies. Many people whose bodies don't function the way they should in different ways. And every person whose body will one day wear out. Then take this brokenness a step deeper in light of sexuality in 1 Corinthians 6. Some of us have physical desires for the opposite sex that lead us to think thoughts about others or have desires for others or do things with others that are not pleasing to God according to his word. Some of us have physical desires for the same sex that lead us to think, a desire, or do things that are not pleasing to God according to his word. Some of us have questions about the way God has made us sexually to the point where we sometimes feel like we don't fit or belong even in our physical bodies. Some of our bodies have significant struggles even when it comes to sexual disability or 
infertility or abnormalities or cancers or sicknesses. And amidst all of this, all of us, all of us are prone to fulfill physical desires we have in ways that are contrary to God's word. All of us have at some point, most of us at many, many points, whether in our past or our present, have sought to fulfill physical desires in ways that are contrary to God's word. And in addition to all of that, some of us have physically been hurt, abused, and are broken by people who have done things to our bodies that are contrary to God's word. Like I could go on and on here, but the point is each of us are different. Our experiences and even some of our desires are different, and there are even different degrees to which we have experienced brokenness in this world. But in the end, in this broken world, we all have broken bodies in ways that significantly affect all of us. You look here at 1 Corinthians 6, the Bible is showing us how bodily sin, and by that I mean sin that we carry out with our bodies or sin that someone carries out against our bodies. Bodily sin harms inevitably. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, some of the Corinthians saw no harm in practicing prostitution. All things are lawful, they said, but God is asking, is it helpful to your body and to others' bodies? God's saying just because you are allowed or able to do something with your body doesn't mean it's helpful for your body. Bodily sin harms inevitably. Second, God says bodily sin controls quickly. All things are lawful for me, the thinking in Corinth went, but the Bible says I will not be dominated by anything. Bodily impulses can cause you and me to do foolish things in an instant that can lead to consequences that last for a lifetime. Which leads to this reality, bodily sin devastates painfully. That's what these verses in 16 and 17 are all about. The Bible's saying specifically sexual immorality unites you with another person that affects all of who you are in a way that's different even from other sin. Verse 18, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sin, sins against his own body. The Bible's saying here, don't underestimate the effect of bodily sin, particularly sexual sin. It destroys lives, it breaks marriages, it shatters homes and kids, it causes heartache, hurt, and pain. It leads to all sorts of other sin, lying, stealing, cheating, bitterness, hatred, slander, gossip, unforgiveness, even murder. Think David in the Old Testament, who in a moment of physical desire sinned against Bathsheba in a way that eventually led to the murder of Uriah, the death of a baby, and a sword that would never depart from David's house. David's life and the lives of so many others were devastated as a result of that one moment. Like bodily sin devastates painfully and ultimately bodily sin condemns eternally. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. What's God saying right before the passage we read earlier? Listen closely. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, bodily sin is addressed here in many different ways, but don't miss the language pertaining to all these ways. Those who sin, who go outside of God's design for our bodies, will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says it twice. How we use our bodies on earth affects our lives for eternity. So you put all this together, this is not a good picture of our bodies. Maybe even picture it this way. Like it started out good, like a piece of pottery, each of our bodies beautifully and wonderfully formed and fashioned as clay by God in his image, for his glory, for our good, on this earth, for our good in eternity. But we've all sinned against God with our bodies. Some of us have been sinned against in our bodies. Sin that whether we've committed it or it's been committed against us has inevitably harmed and quickly controlled and painfully devastated us. And sin in our own bodies that eternally condemns us and the picture is clear and this is the problem with clay right as beautiful as it is it it breaks and this is the problem with all our lives in this broken world like we all have broken bodies and the evidences of this brokenness are scattered all over our lives looks different in different ways but I think about the hurt and pain that some of us experience that doesn't ever seem to go away for some it's 
guilt from the past that you can't ever seem to shake? Maybe struggles in the present that you can't ever seem to escape? Maybe it's questions about why you have this or that desire or why you give in to this or that temptation or confusion about why if the body is good do I experience all these things that God says are not good or maybe it's just a constant battle with unfulfilled desire in a world where Sometimes it feels like nobody else understands what we're walking through. Like it's broken hearts, it's broken homes, it's broken relationships, it's broken bodies. Like this is all of us. So is there any hope for broken bodies in a broken world. And the good news I have for you tonight is there absolutely is hope because Jesus gave his body to make your body new. I can hear straight from God in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Did you hear that? Such were some of you. But, so something has happened to change this. But you were washed. And Jesus takes that which is dirty and he makes it clean. You were sanctified. You see that word? You know what it means? It means to be made whole to be made a holy, made perfect. You were justified. That word means declared not guilty. So how is that possible? How is it possible for the dirty to be made clean, for the guilty to be made innocent, for the broken to be made whole? It is only possible in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And you say, what's so special about Jesus? What makes him the only one who can make my body, our bodies new? Well, listen to God in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. Here's why Jesus is your only hope for a broken body made new. Because he came, God himself in the flesh, into this broken world with a body to die on a cross and to rise from the grave so that you and I could be forgiven of all our sins committed in these bodies, now filled with his spirit in these bodies. And we can know that one day when this body dies, we will live with a fully redeemed, fully restored, completely new body that is free from all sin and free from all suffering, free to experience the full pleasure that God has designed for our bodies for ever. Not just in the future though, but now as men and women made in God's image, God commands us then to flee sexual immorality. That's the clear command in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Thessalonians 4. And remember, whenever God gives us a negative command like this, like we see in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Thessalonians 4, don't do this, run from this, flee this. Whenever God gives us a negative command, he's always giving us two positives. One, God is always pointing us to something better. And two, God is always protecting us from something worse. Always remember these two things. Whenever you see God saying, don't do this, run from this. He's always pointing us to something better and protecting us from something worse. So don't rise up in prideful resistance when you see a negative command from God and think, God's trying to keep me from having fun or fulfillment. Remember, that's exactly what Adam and Eve thought in the Garden of Eden. God said, don't eat from this tree. What was God doing when he gave them that negative command? He was pointing them to something better, positive, good, namely every other tree in Eden that he designed for their good. And God was protecting them from something worse. He was protecting them from death. But Adam and Eve didn't believe him. They said, God must be keeping something good from us. That must be really good fruit. So they ate it, convinced that it would fulfill them. But they were deceived. They were dead wrong and were all prone to think the same way. Picture this way. But when I have a a four-year-old playing outside in the yard and I tell them, don't run out into the road, I'm telling them that for their good. 
because I know what could happen when a car comes racing down the street. So I lovingly give them this restriction because I know it's good for them. I want to point them to the place where playing is safe and they can flourish and have all the fun they want in the yard. And I want to protect them from that which could be harmful to them in the road. And wouldn't it be the height of arrogance for a four-year-old to tell me, I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to cars in the road. That that's exactly what you and I are prone to say to God with our bodies. You don't know what you're talking about. I know the way to fulfillment in this body. It's arrogance. And we live in a culture today that celebrates that arrogance and actually encourages you and me at every turn to speak this way to God. Meanwhile, God is saying, don't run out into this road. It harms, it controls, it devastates, it condemns forever. It leads you to miss the kingdom of God altogether. So what's the road we're not supposed to go into, go near What are we supposed to avoid, flee from, run away from as fast as we can? 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. And those four words in that command, I'm convinced, are some of the most counter-cultural words in all the Bible, meaning this command goes so against the grain of everything our culture is shouting, even the way many of us in the church are prone to think. Because here's what sexual immorality means. The word in the original language, the New Testament there is porneia, and it's a general term that refers to any and all sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman. So in this negative command, as God is saying, don't do this, don't run out into this road, God is saying, flee any and all sexual activity outside of marriage between a husband and a wife. The Bible clearly and consistently teaches that sexual activity is exclusively for marriage between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, to the point where there's not one place in God's word where God celebrates sexual activity outside of marriage between a husband and a wife. So you're seeing how countercultural this is in the world and how pervasive this is in every single one of our lives, and are we getting the point? None of us is immune to this. None of us is immune to sexual temptation. We've talked about how we're all tempted in different ways, many of us with different desires, but all of us are prone to not trust God on this one. Students, you are, senior adults, you are, and everywhere in between, which is why we must all avoid selective moral outrage, pointing out sexual immorality in others while ignoring it in ourselves. I am, we are all guilty at multiple levels of sexual thought, desire, speech, action, outside of marriage between a husband and a wife. All of us in our hearts are prone to turn aside from God's ways to our wants in each of our lives, which inevitably affects our sexuality. And to make matters worse, we were born this way. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, every single person born of man and woman has inherited this sinful heart. We may have all different biological heritages, but we all have one spiritual inheritance called sin, which is why, and this is really important, none of us can or should say, well, God wouldn't allow me or someone else to be born with a bent toward a particular sexual sin because the Bible's clear, all of us are born with a bent toward sexual sin. But just because we have that bent doesn't mean we must act on it. And this is so significant to understand in a culture where it's assumed that a natural explanation implies a moral obligation, that if you physically have a desire, it's essential to your nature to act on that desire. Which, by the way, and this is one reason why the contemporary discussion of sexuality is wrongly framed as an issue of civil rights, and there's so much we could talk about here, but we've so elevated personal desires to the highest level of moral authority so that people have a right to fulfill whatever sexual desires we prefer, and to say that someone should not fulfill that right is akin to racism. But this way of thinking, unbiblically, unwisely, unwisely, and unhelpfully, conflates ethnic identity and sexual activity. Ethnic identity is a morally neutral attribute. The Bible's clear that black or white or brown is not an issue of right or wrong. Any attempt to say otherwise should be opposed. So we'll talk about that in just a minute as we see clearly and biblically that God says all people are equally created in his image no matter what their skin color is. But sexual activity is different. It is a morally chosen behavior. And sexual activity, to be clear, is well similar to how we may have different skin colors. We may possess different desires or have different dispositions toward different behaviors, but where our ethnic makeup is not in any way determined by a moral choice or contrary to a moral command, our sexual behavior is a moral decision. And just because we're inclined to certain behaviors doesn't make those behaviors right and good. And we all know this. Some researchers say that infidelity may be in our genes, but we all know that doesn't mean a married woman who has a desire for a woman who's not his wife must fulfill that desire in order to be happy or be fully himself. No, the presence of a desire doesn't mean we must act on that desire in order to be whole, in order to be fully ourselves. But do you see the way sexual immorality works in a broken world? Like it starts with sexual desire. We want something which we then equate with sexual identity. We are someone. We assume that what we want is who we are, and we define ourselves according to our desires, which then means that if I'm to be 
who I fully am, then I must do this, which leads to sexual activity. We act on our desires. This is the way of the world. And we've already seen how foolish it is. Just because a married man has a desire for someone, not his wife, doesn't mean that in order to be fully himself, he must act in unfaithfulness to his wife. God, help us to see this, not just in others' lives and situations, but in our own lives. We all have sinful hearts that are prone to want our ways over God's word, specifically here in 1 Corinthians 6, that are prone to desire sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman. And we live in a world that says, that's who we are. That's what it means to be a teenager. That's what it means to be a male or a female or a transgender or gender neutral or straight or lesbian or gay or so many other identifications that we design as we identify ourselves in all these different ways and convince ourselves that satisfaction and fulfillment will only be found as we, as we act and live according to these desires desires, yet what we're actually living out is an age-old lie that's been around since Adam and Eve from the beginning of time, summarized in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There are ways that seem right to us, but in the end, they lead to death for us, which leads to the last truth here about humanity and sexuality as men and women made in God's image. God calls us to satisfaction in him and his word. Jesus, God in a body, comes to this broken world and to every single one of us, no matter what our desires, questions, or real struggles may be, and Jesus gives the same invitation to every single one of us. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What a statement. Jesus uses a bodily desire, a desire more fundamental than even sexual desire, the desire for food that we all have, something we all need in order to flourish. And Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of all your desires. I am the one you need to flourish. Come to me, you won't be hungry. Believe in me, trust in me, you shall never, ever thirst. And it makes sense. Jesus, God in the flesh, the one who created your body in the first place, come to him, believe in him. Don't go to this world. Don't believe what this world says. Don't trust this world. Don't trust yourself. Trust Trust in God. God loves you. God is for you. God has made a way for your soul and your body to be satisfied in him. Now, to be clear, this means saying no to desires in your body, in your flesh. Remember Jesus' initial words to anyone who would follow him. Luke chapter 9, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whatever loses his life for my sake will save it. And this is Jesus' invitation to every single one of us to find life in dying to ourselves and turning from our desires, all kinds of them. Jesus beckons all of us then, single and married, male and female, whoever we are, with whatever desires we have, to turn from ourselves, and as we've already seen, to find new identity in him. This is Galatians 2.20. Jesus totally turns the table as we find an entirely new identity that's no longer defined by the sexual desires in our bodies, but that's defined by the Savior who died for our bodies. And he died not just to save us, but to satisfy us. This call to follow Jesus is ultimately not a call to unfulfilled desire. The call to follow Jesus is a call to the fulfillment of our deepest desires in dying to ourselves and living in Jesus and the one who loves us and gave himself for us, for you. Oh, just, I wanna just bring this down to your life. For every person who's put your trust in Jesus, I wanna remind you tonight in this broken world with our broken bodies that Jesus has bought your body on a cross, has filled your body with his spirit, and Jesus is right now in your body and he's committed to making you new. He's committed to bringing healing amidst your hurt. He's committed to bringing victory in your struggles. In this broken world, Jesus loves you, and he's committed to giving you everything you need to experience earthly and eternal good as you glorify God in your body if you will only keep trusting in him and looking to him and leaning on him and believing that he will make your body new. And I know there's an adversary, an accuser, who is saying to some of you right now, don't believe this. A healing, victory made new, you're broken way beyond that. Now just look at those broken pieces. You can't put them back together. If you, even if you could put every piece in place, there would still be breaks. You're broken. You are or you have messed up too much or you've been hurt too deeply. You are broken beyond repair. And to anyone who is tempted to think that, I am here to tell you tonight on the authority of Jesus himself, as if he is speaking directly to you right now, you are not beyond repair. Let me give you a picture. There's a Japanese art form 
called kintsugi. I'm not 100% sure I'm saying that right, but the word means golden joinery. And it's a form of art that takes broken pottery and actually puts the broken pieces back together. But then instead of hiding the breaks between the pieces, they actually fill those breaks, those gaps, with gold. So the whole idea is that an artist intentionally takes something that's broken. And instead of seeing those breaks as something to hide and disguise, to pretend like they're not there, the artist actually fills those breaks with gold, turning it into an entirely new piece of pottery that is beautiful in a completely different, altogether stunning way. Where there were once breaks, there's now beauty. And in this picture, right now, in this moment, I want you to see what the master artist, the God who formed you in the first place, is able to do with the brokenness in your life. And I am not saying this is easy. I'm not saying this doesn't take time, but I am saying this is the whole reason Jesus came. He came to give his life, his body, to make your body new in a way that takes your brokenness and makes you beautiful. Not with gold, but with his blood that is more precious than gold. Jesus has the power to make your body glorious. So with this picture in our minds, here's what I want to do, knowing that we are all different with different experiences and temptations and hurts and brokenness. I want to give you a moment just to reflect on this before we move on. And so, specifically, I want to ask you to reflect on this question. How are you tempted to go outside of God's good design for your body and your thoughts and desires and actions? And I should add, even though it's not written there, now, where do you need God to bring healing in your body? Maybe just write out your thoughts there in your study guide. And, and maybe if there are certain things that are really sensitive that you don't even want to write down, it's totally fine. Just put a star or some other symbol on the page. Like, you know what that is. God certainly does. And maybe in this reflection to write out a prayer for God's help, for you to trust him with your body to heal your body and for his help as you desire to glorify God with your body in these ways. So just spend a, a moment between you and God and then I'll come back and close this reflection time with prayer.
Let me bring us back together to pray, God help us in this broken world with broken bodies. We want to experience your healing and we want to experience your good design for our bodies. So help us in all the ways that you have brought to our minds and our hearts over the last couple of minutes. Jesus, thank you for dying in your body for our bodies and for the hope of resurrected bodies one day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we could spend like the rest of the night here on any one of these issues, but we're gonna keep moving on from one to the next and hopefully, obviously just a couple moments to reflect, uh, does not do near enough sufficient uh, time and attention for an issue like we just walked through. And that's gonna be the case for each of these issues, but hopefully to see biblical foundations for all of these things and at least give a moment to let it soak in before we then move on to so the next issue, humanity and race. So I feel like I'm gonna say all throughout this night, there's easily a secret church we could dive into just here. But we're gonna do a flyover. So how does God's, God's word about us as humans apply to race and racism? And obviously we're not looking here at man's thoughts or theories about race, but what does God say? And God speaks very clearly about this. First, regardless of who we are, or what we look like, we share universal dignity and value before God and before one another. We all have a common ancestry from Adam and Eve. We are equal members of a common race. Second, we're united in our humanity, yet diverse in our ethnicity. So not far into the Bible, we begin to see various clans dwelling in distant lands as separate nations with assorted languages, particularly after Babel. And by Genesis chapter 12, in the picture of humanity in the Bible, we see an extensive and extraordinary diversity with a basic and beautiful unity described later in Acts 17 as all the nations and peoples of mankind living on the earth, which leads to a third reality we see in scripture. God loves and pursues all people in all people groups. God loves the world. John 3, Jesus died for the sins of the world. 1 John 2, he doesn't want any to per, anyone to perish. 2 Peter 3, God blesses the people of Israel for the spread of his blessing to all peoples. Genesis chapter 12, Psalm 67, Jesus commands his church to proclaim the good news of his grace in all the nations. Matthew chapter 28, he fills his disciples with the power of his spirit for this purpose. Acts 1, he makes clear in the book of Acts that the gospel is not just for Jews, but for the Gentiles, for all the nations. God loves and pursues all peoples and all people groups, which is why repentance and forgiveness of sins must be proclaimed in all people groups. That's part of the essence of the gospel according to Luke chapter 24. And God is worthy of glory, honor, and praise from every people group. And his worth will one day be worshiped from people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. All of this. There's one more reality worth noting from God's word before we get to race and racism in the world today. The church is referred to in scripture as a chosen race, a holy nation, a distinct people for God's own possession. That language straight from 1 Peter chapter two, where we basically see one physical race of humanity divided into two spiritual races. Those who are in Adam are condemned by God because of sin. Those who are now in Christ are redeemed by God through faith in Jesus. And how does one become a part or a member of this redeemed race? As we've seen, humanity's standing before God cannot be improved by individual accomplishment or biological bloodline, justification, before God is only possible by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. Jesus' revolutionary bloodline creates a countercultural family of multi-ethnic unity called the church. And in this family, as we've seen, now we're beginning to see the application of race. Dividing walls of hostility are destroyed between Jews and Gentiles or any ethnicities for that matter. In the words of Aubrey Sequeira, so he's an Indian brother pastoring a multi-ethnic church in Abu Dhabi. While homogeneity in churches simply reinforces the status quo of society, the biblical evidence shows us that the gospel broke down and cut across ethnic, social, economic, and cultural barriers in ways never seen before in history. Indeed, reconciliation before God has paved the way for reconciliation with each other, regardless of ethnic differences or even divisions in this world. In the words of Colossians 3.11, here there's not Greek and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. We are one eternal family and one household. We share one Holy Spirit and we have one heavenly father. So what does all this mean for how we understand race and racism in the world? Well, clearly, according to what God teaches about all of us, without exception, as men and women made in his image with equal dignity and value, racism then is a fundamental perversion of God's good design for humanity. 
And let me define racism here so that we're all on the same page with what I'm meaning by this word. As sinners, we pervert a biblical concept of race by classifying groups of people into different races based on arbitrary char characteristics in order to assign different values and distinct advantages to some groups over others. So characteristics like skin tone or hair texture, facial features, class, caste, geography, ancestry, language. So we classify groups of people into different races based on these characteristics in order to assign different values or distinct advantages to some groups over others. And in the process of denying our shared roots in the human race by devising this hierarchy of different races, which as we've seen goes against God's word from the start, we are committing the sin of racism, valuing one race, quote unquote, over another in our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions, or devaluing one race beneath another in our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. And various expressions of racism could include thoughts, feelings, words, actions, expectations, relationships, laws, policies, procedures, and or systems and structures which comprise a lot of the above that either value one race over another or devalue one race beneath another. So while racism, the word, is not in the Bible, expressions of racism are clearly rooted in sins that are in the Bible, including pride before God, pride before others. See Jonah and his hatred of the Assyrians and his desire for them to not even be saved, his disgust when God saves them. Racism is also rooted in partiality toward people, like we see in Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan, how the Levite and the priest responded to him or didn't respond to him. Racism is rooted in a propensity toward prejudice, much like Peter, along with many other Jews, experienced at one point toward the Gentiles. And racism can also be rooted in personal preferences as we prefer one type of person over another for a variety of unjust, unrighteous, unholy reasons. And in all of this, God calls us to resist racism. And every expression of racism in every way, much like Peter needed to learn in Acts chapter 10. We must reject any and all semblance of a hierarchy of different races from our personal thoughts to the practices of the world around us. We repel any and every inclination in us to exalt or devalue any race over or beneath another. In the words of Francis Grimke, he's a prominent African-American pastor in D.C. during the late 1800s and early 1900s, race prejudice can't be talked down, it must be lived down. God's word compels us to refrain from partial ways of relating, biased ways of thinking, derogatory ways of speaking, discriminatory ways of acting toward anyone because of any of these arbitrary characteristics. And we repent of all intentional expressions of racism, even as we recognize how our actions can unintentionally either express racism or contribute to the effects of racism. We must be careful to resist any way in which racism around us, whether it's from our family upbringing to our surrounding culture, has influenced our thoughts, feelings, words, or actions regarding different groups of people. We resist being conformed to the ways this world thinks, Romans 12. And just like God told his people time and time again to put away foreign gods that were worshiped by their forefathers, we must be intentional about making sure we resist expressions of racism that may have been passed down to us. At the same time in all this, we rejoice in all the ways God graciously works in our hearts to overcome evidences or expressions of racism in and around us. We acknowledge and celebrate God's grace in these ways. And we don't just resist, resist racism, yes, that, but on a more proactive level in Christ, God calls us to commit ourselves to true multi-ethnic community, to community with people who have different characteristics than us, that comprise different ethnicities from us. In true multi-ethnic community, we appreciate our ethnic differences without assigning more or less value to them. It's not that we disregard our differences and we don't discount or erase those differences altogether. When Paul says in Galatians 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek or slave or free or male or female, you're one in Christ. He's not saying, well, you're not a man or a woman anymore. You're no longer a Jew or a Greek. Yes, you are these things, but you don't assign more or less value to each other based on those things. Instead, we see our diversity as God sees our diversity as a stunning portrait of his creativity that exalts his glory as our creator much like we'll see in heaven for all of eternity. But as long as we're here on this earth in the context of true multi-ethnic community, we listen to, we learn from, lament with, love one another, especially when talking about racism and expressions of racism and the hurt and pain involved in both past and present, we are quick to listen and slow to speak, James 1. We don't just share our opinion, Proverbs 18. We seek to understand others. We weep with those who weep, Romans 12, with patient love, 1 Corinthians 13. We don't assign or attribute guilt or shame to one another for expressions of racism in others, including those who've gone before us or those who may look like us or even sin for which we have repented. Like true multi-ethnic community is great 
race-saturated community that doesn't gloss over sin. No, we grieve over the existence and effects of racism in us, around us, in the past, in the present. We appropriately confess corporate sins of racism, take appropriate steps of repentance, much like we see all over the Old Testament. It's right to pray we prayers in which we identify with others in sin and our desire for repentance. And we're zealous in the present not to prolong or replicate in any way racial injustice from the past, to remove those high places, to use that language from 2 Kings chapter 14. And in all this, we examine our hearts. Search my heart, O God. Open my eyes to any grievous way in me. Psalm 139. We examine our hearts humbly and continually for expressions of racism with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of brothers and sisters in Christ who enable us to see sin in us and sin's effects around us in ways we might not see ourselves. We all need this in our lives, in the church. Jesus makes that clear. Matthew 18, Acts 6, Galatians 6, and in true multi-ethnic community, we do all of the above in relationships with one another, marked by grace, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another as the Lord bears with us, forgiving one another as the Lord forgives us, just as Colossians 3 outlines. Remember, as we're being conformed in the image of Jesus, he is transforming the way we relate to each other and love each other and care for each other in all these ways. This is the kind of community, true multi-ethnic community that God is calling us to as his church. And as we pursue that kind of community in the church, we pray and work as the Lord leads us for justice for people, all people, regardless of race. We go back to Micah 6, 8, Genesis 1, Psalm 8. God has told us to do this for the good of humanity, for the glory of his name. So we do justice. We deplore any hierarchy of race in the body of Christ or the world around us. We celebrate interracial marriages, multiracial families. We train our children to hate racism. We work against any injustice that's in any way due to a person or a group of people because of their race, which is another way of saying, look back at what we saw about doing justice, apply that specifically to any person or group of people who's being treated unjustly in the world because of their race, knowing that this battle against racism is a spiritual battle at the core against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, Ephesians 6. Race is more than a social strong construct. It is a spiritual stronghold, 2 Corinthians 10. We need to remember that Satan is the ultimate agitator behind human discord. And the history and ongoing reality of racism in our world is the outworking of his utter hatred for humanity. We need to realize that the devil and his demons are actively deceiving people into thinking and acting like they are intrinsically superior or inferior to others based upon a sinful perversion of the biblical concept of race. They are are actively trying to destroy individuals and relationships, entire groups of people. The devil and his demons are attempting to rob people of their God-given dignity and keep people from their God-given rights and actively working to divide people, especially God's people in the church of Jesus Christ. So don't be surprised when you see divisions along these lines in the church. This is a clear strategy of Satan, which means the battle against racism is a battle against Satan. We need to see his fingerprints in racism and expressions of racism and the havoc they cause. And once we see this spiritual battle for what it is, we realize there's only one way to win the battle. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our only hope in the battle against racism. And because of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, we know Satan has ultimately been defeated. Satan will one day be destroyed, Revelation 12, which means all who are in Christ. We know Satan's destiny and we need to, need to embrace our identity. In Christ, we've already seen 2 Corinthians 5, we are new creations. We're now a diverse family of brothers and sisters joyfully united by the gospel of Jesus Christ on a mission to make disciples among all the nations. So as the church, we humbly, kindly, lovingly, confidently lock arms together across all ethnic dividing lines, Philippians 1, standing firm in one spirit with one side, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And together we proclaim the judge of the world while we do justice in the world. We proclaim the gospel and we do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor, him who has been robbed, doing right for the sojourner, fatherless, widow, and needy, Jeremiah 22, 3, in a way that reflects God our Father, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. And as we proclaim the gospel and we do justice, we look forward to the day when Jesus will return and racism will be no more. When people from every tribe, language, and nation are in one kingdom as priests to our God, are reigning together in a new heaven and a new earth. So, all that to say for reflection, let's pause for a moment before we move on. And in light of that quick flyover, would you just take a few minutes? And I really want to encourage you to do this. I hope, I pray. The Spirit is speaking to you now through his words. So don't just move past this or think, this is not an important time in, in this whole deal tonight. Like treat this time like it's just as important as anything else we're doing. What are one or two practical steps 
God may be leading you to take that you're not already taking to address racial injustice in the world. Or even I would add racial, in, racial division in the church. So starting in your own life, your family, or your church family, and then broadening out to the world around you. And maybe, maybe more than one or two things come to your mind. By all means, keep going as long as God is bringing things to your mind. But spend a couple of moments just reflecting on this, and then I'll come back and pray for us. Oh God, we hate racism and expressions of racism around us and within us. Uh, and we pray, God, for your help to apply your word about who we are as one human race, who we are in the church as a chosen race, as your people. Help us to apply your word in ways that build unity in your church across ethnic lines and in our culture and the world around us in ways that promote justice and that which is right for all people regardless of some of these arbitrary characteristics that we have as people in so many different ways classified people according to. Lord, help us, we pray. In each of our lives, our families, as your church in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Oh. I just want you to know, as we're running through these things uh, at a pretty good clip, pretty good pace, I, I, I feel uh, like these are things we could spend so much more time on. I hope that you're getting foundations that you can go back through and process through and, and really spend even more time reflecting on individually, as families and church families. Uh, none of these issues are issues we need to fly over, big picture. Uh, but we are, we're definitely flying over them uh, at a pretty good clip uh, tonight. So we're going to hit one more issue and uh, in a flyover fashion and then take our break. And, and it, like, like racism, like humanity and abortion, to think, okay, we're about to go really fast here, but not because this isn't important, but because, well, there's so much we could cover. We have covered this before in a previous secret church, but I could not not include this issue here because it applies so directly to what I would call the most clear and present physical danger to humanity on a daily basis in the world and specifically in my country. But I do want to say before we begin and, and not in a fast way that I know there are women and men listening right now who have participated in abortions and this is so hard to walk through in ways I don't presume to imagine some who have chosen abortion, others who have had abortion forced upon you, both of which lead to all kinds of emotions and scars that, again, I don't presume to fully understand, but I so want to empathize with. Even as we see stark truth from Scripture about abortion, so yes, I want to show the seriousness of how God's Word addresses this issue, but as I was praying for this, even this moment tonight, I, I, I thought about the teenage girl or the woman who may have just found out that you're pregnant and maybe your mind is spinning in all kinds of directions or others who've thought about abortion in the past or might think in the future about having an abortion and I want us to hear what God's word says about how serious this issue is and I'm not just speaking to women to be clear but to men who often either encourage or stand silently by in abortion and at the same time I want to be compassionate in every way to the countless women and, and men who have been affected by abortion. I want you to see, to hear, to feel the love of God in Christ for you in these moments more than anything else. So hang with me, especially hang with me to the end of this section, even as we think about the seriousness of this issue. So in the United States, over 50 million abortions have occurred since 1973. Some research says over 60 million, but that's 50 to 60 million lives lost. On average, that's over a million abortions every year, nearly 3,000 abortions every day, an abortion every 20 to 25 seconds. And approximately one-third of American women have an abortion at some point in their lives. And then you broad that to the world, and over 50 million abortions, abortions occur every year in the world. That's over 130,000 abortions every day. A woman has an abortion almost every second of every day. So let's think about this reality in light of what we've seen about humanity. Think about abortion and God. Psalm 139, the psalmist writes, You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your, your eyes saw my unformed substance. Now, this passage makes clear that abortion is an affront to God's sovereign authority as creator. He is the giver of life. He is the taker of life, not us. And abortion is an assault on God's glorious work in creation, on the work that God is doing in the womb. The way God creates people compels praise. Psalm 139, Psalm 104, and the psalmist didn't even know what we know now how God takes a little egg and sperm and brings them together and how two weeks later a human heart is beating, circulating its own blood. Within a few more weeks, the fingers are forming on hands and brain waves are detectable. After just six and a half weeks, these inward parts are moving and two weeks later, there are discernible fingerprints and there's discernible sexuality and kidneys are forming and functioning. Then a gallbladder. By the 12th week, all the organs of a baby's body are functional and the baby can cry. All that within three months, the first trimester, heart, organs, brain, sexuality, movement, reaction, and God on high is doing all of this in a way that evokes awe and amazement and worship and praise. So to imagine at that moment during this time period, inserting a tool or taking a pill or undergoing an operation that takes the life God is designing and destroys it. This is without question an assault on God's glorious work in creation. There's no way around this. Most abortions take place between 10 and 14 weeks of gestation. That's what they say is the optimal time for dismemberment and removal. 
and the beauty of what God is doing and the intricacy of the person God is forming is destroyed. And this is in large part the crux of the debate concerning abortion, like what is going on in the womb? And the Bible's clear, the womb contains a person formed in the image of God. Just as we've seen in Genesis 1, God's knitting together a human being crowned with glory and honor. Now, people have argued and will argue what full personhood is. When does an embryo or a fetus become a person? And this is the most important question. Virtually every argument in the abortion controversy comes back to this one question. What is the unborn? What or who is in the womb? Because once that question is answered, every other question comes into perspective. If the unborn is not human, then no justification for abortion is necessary. Some say the unborn is not a human person. It's just a non-viable tissue mass, merely a part of a woman's body. Others say it's only a potential human or a human that's not yet a person. And the reality is if that's true, then the argument's over. Have the abortion. No justification for abortion would be necessary. On the other hand, if the unborn is human, no justification for abortion is adequate. This is where I'm indebted to Gregory Kukul wrote a great little booklet called Precious Unborn Human Persons, a great little resource. People say abortion is such a complex issue. There's just no easy answers. But if that which is in the womb is a person, then this issue is not complex at all. Like think about it. If it's true that what is in the womb is a person, then every single justification for abortion falls apart. People say, but women have a right to privacy with their doctors. Well, certainly we all have a right to a measure of privacy. No privacy argument, though, is a cover for doing serious harm to another innocent human being. We have laws that invade all of our privacy when we start harming another human's welfare. Privacy is not the real issue here. But women should have the freedom to choose, some might say. Well, yes, some things, but not all things. Yes, we have freedom to choose whether to have children or not. We don't have the freedom to eliminate toddlers or teenagers who are inconvenient to us. No woman has the freedom to harm her child if it's a child, right? But making abortions illegal, some might say, forces women to find more dangerous ways to abort their babies. Well, if it's dangerous to harm a person, do we make it easier for them to do that? If it's dangerous to rob a bank, should we make it convenient for bank robbers? Well, of course not. But but more children would create a drain on the economy. When human beings get expensive, though, does that mean we get rid of them? That's actually in part what Margaret Sanger was saying, but more on that later. Just think about it. So Kukul mentions... A little girl named Rachel, the daughter of family of friends of his, and he describes her this way. Think of a little girl named Rachel. This is there in your notes. Rachel's two months old, but she's still six weeks away from being a full-term baby. She was born prematurely at 24 weeks in the middle of her mother's second trimester. On the day of her birth, Rachel weighed one pound, nine ounces, but dropped to just under a pound soon after. She was so small she could rest in the palm of her daddy's hand. She was a tiny, living human person. Heroic measures were taken to save this child's life. Why? Because we have an obligation to protect, nurture, and care for other humans who would die without our help, especially little children. Rachel was a vulnerable and valuable human being. But get this, if a doctor came into the hospital room and instead of caring for Rachel, took the life of this little girl as she lay quietly nursing in her mother's breast, it would be homicide. However, this, if this same little girl, the very same Rachel, was inches away from resting inside, or inches away resting inside her mother's womb, she could be legally killed by abortion. This makes no sense. It's utterly ludicrous. If this is a person, a child in the womb, everything, everything revolves around what is happening in the womb. And the scripture is clear. God's word is clear. The womb contains a person being formed in God's image. You can't believe God's word and deny that. And once that's realized, there's absolutely no adequate justification for abortion. And one of the wonderful things that Psalm 139 does for us, it gives us a glimpse into what God sees and what God does in the womb. When we read it, we realize though the unborn is visibly hidden from man, he or she is never hidden from God. God sees, God works, he's forming, knitting, creating, nurturing, shaping, crafting in a way that evokes praise and awe and abortion is an assault on that glorious work of God. The way God creates people compels praise and all of God's works are wonderful. Psalm 139, 14. This is key because part of, in a sense, much of, but especially part of the contemporary defense for abortion involves denying this reality. Abortions here and around the world happen because childbearing is seen as inconvenient or costly or inadvisable. And with the advancement of medical technology, whether it's the ability to detect sexuality in a country maybe where boys are preferred over girls or disability, It's obviously possible to determine whether or not a baby in a womb has Down syndrome or has some particular debilitating disease that will affect their life. So should abortion be permissible in these circumstances? Well, not if you believe Psalm 139, 14, not if you believe all of God's works are wonderful because when you believe this, when you know this and you know that God's work is wonderful, even or especially in the case of disability, this is all over scripture. John 9, man born blind, the crowds ask, whose fault is this? Jesus answered, this is not his parents' fault or 
It's a person's fault. This happened so the wonderful works of God might be revealed to and through him. God did this so that one day this man would see, declare, and delight in his glory. Now, I don't presume to know all the difficulties involved with disabilities. It's one of the many things I love about the church. I have the privilege of pastoring with many families, with children with special needs. And to think that many other children like them had their lives taken before they were even born is inconceivable. Don't deny the wonderful work of God, even or especially in disability. God's works are wonderful, even or especially in the case of disability, and even or especially in the midst of difficulty. God delights in taking difficult circumstances, even evil circumstances, and turning them into good. Genesis 50, 20. He takes all things, even what seem to be tragic things, and works them for good. This is who our God is, Romans 8, 28. It's at this point, though, that some people ask, well, what about cases of incest or rape? Is abortion justifiable then? And I cannot presume to know what it's like to be in such a situation. Like, I shudder at the horror of these evils. And I, I know people have walked alongside people who walked through this. And I don't presume to know all the physical and emotional toll that this takes upon not only a woman, but her family. But you bring this back to the fundamental question, is this a baby in the womb? Is this a person? And if so, then everything changes. Would you take the life of a child who is out of the womb because they were conceived by rape? Of course not. Then why would we take the life of a child in the womb because they were conceived by rape? And why should a child pay for his father's crime? Deuteronomy 24, 16. How should we treat an innocent child who reminds us of a terrible experience with love and mercy? People say, well, what about the emotional toll on the woman? Well, and, and others, like, think about that. If, if the rapist was caught, would we allow the woman to take the life of the rapist in order to have emotional relief? Like, no. Then why would we say to take the life of the innocent child? Instead, like, I'm, again, not saying this is easy. I'm not saying this is easy at all. I am saying this, though, because Scripture is saying this. And this is the message of the gospel, that God takes unimaginable evil and turns it into ultimate good. God took Joseph's brother's attempt to murder him and turned it into saving an entire people, Genesis 50, 20. God took incest, incest. Look at Genesis 38, incest between Judah and Tamar. And then look at Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus, and see that incest was way back in the family line that led to the coming of Jesus, the Son of God. Then Acts 2, God takes the murder of his son and makes it the means of our salvation. The gospel says we can trust God that all his works, even the ones we least understand, are wonderful. Abortion is an affront to God's sovereign authorities, creator, an assault on God's glorious work in creation, and an attack on God's intimate relationship with the unborn. How God fashions them, he values them, he knows them, he relates to them, he calls them, he names them, he anoints them. There is image bearers. That's what the Bible teaches, which leads to abortion and the gospel. So God is the judge of sin and sinners, including mothers who have aborted babies, fathers who have encouraged abortion, or and I would add people who have forced others to have abortion, parents and grandparents who have supported abortion, doctors who have performed abortion, and leaders who have permitted abortion, whether in the church or in government. And on a side note here, I would simply draw your attention to Romans 13, where Paul in the New Testament addresses the role of civil authorities and our responsibility to civil authorities. And the picture there is clear. Government is given by God for the good of all people, including those in the womb. And government is given by God for the legislation of morality. This is foundational. Many people have said, but it's not the state's job or the job of the government to legislate morality. But that's a sham argument, and we all know it. The state does have responsibility of legislating morality, saying that stealing is wrong, lying is wrong, murder is wrong, a host of other things are wrong. Now, when it comes to the issue of abortion, people immediately say, well, we should not take someone's right to choose away from them, but the government exists to take people's right to choose away from them. You can't choose to steal. If you do, there will be consequences. You can't choose to do a whole host of things for which there are laws against, and that's good that government says those things. Yet it's the basis by which many, even many in the church, say, well, maybe I wouldn't have an abortion, but I don't think we should take someone's right to choose away from them. We take people's right to choose evil away from them all the time, every day as a society, and this is really good for all of us. It is good for us to say, no one has the right to do evil. And it's absolute moral silliness and cultural suicide to say that everyone should have the right to do whatever they choose to do. So this is where I wanna call followers of Jesus out of a muddled middle road that says, well, I don't think we should impose morality on somebody else. Let's realize we impose morality on others every day, and this is a good thing for 
all of us. When it comes to evil, it is right for us to oppose it. Wisely, graciously, firmly, humbly, boldly to oppose it. So to say you're pro-choice, well, pro-choice about what? Whether you have uh, this or that kind of food, where you live, what kind of car you drive. Of course, we're pro-choice about these things, but we're not pro-choice about rape. We're not pro-choice about burglary, and we're not pro-choice about kidnapping. So are we pro-choice about taking the lives of children? Brothers and sisters, moral or political neutrality here is not an option, which leads me then to say that God is the judge of sin and sinners, including Christians who have done nothing about abortion. In the words of Randy Alcorn, to endorse or even to be neutral about killing innocent children created in God's image is unthinkable in the scriptures, was unthinkable to Christians in church history, and should be unthinkable to Christians today. God is the judge of sin, and at the same time, God is the savior of sinners. So let me encourage you, sir. Please, please hear this. To anyone, everyone who has aborted a child, supported abortion, encouraged abortion, performed abortion, permitted abortion, or done nothing about abortion, know this. Hear this, like feel this. Lodge this deep within your heart and your mind and your soul. God forgives entirely, entirely. He heals deeply. He restores completely. And ultimately, he redeems fully, which leads to abortion and the church. So what do we do with God's word to us in light of a world of abortion around us? Well, look around and learn the facts about abortion and see the pictures of abortion. We need to feel the weight of an unborn child's humanity and recognize the dreadful reality of abortion. Not to look away from that, to understand the reasons behind abortion. What leads a woman and a man to go this route? And how do we serve and love and care and provide for people at that point, before that point? And to listen to and love the victims of abortion whose wounds are tender and deep. So look around, step forward. If you've had an abortion, share your burdens from the past with brothers and or sisters. If you're contemplating abortion, share your struggles in the present with brothers and or sisters. And speak up before God in prayer and fasting, pleading for children in the womb in our world today. And before the government, to the extent that we're able, work for government that promotes the good of all people, including children in the womb. And I should add, children when they come out of the womb. It makes no sense for us to talk about doing justice for moms and dads and children while a, woman, while a mom is pregnant with a child, but not do justice for them once that child is born. So reach out, reach out through working for justice in high-risk communities, through giving to pro-life causes and ministries, through serving women and men with unwanted pregnancies, through volunteering at pregnancy care centers, through supporting abortion alternatives, through fostering or adopting children, and ultimately through making disciples. I love what CareNet here in the U.S. is doing to make life disciples, encouraging churches to integrate care for men and women with unwanted pregnancies into the fabric of disciple-making in the church. So... In light of this real and present danger to so many children and moms and dads in the world, I want to give you a moment to reflect before we close this second session. So what are one or two steps God is leading you to take from the list of action steps above? Like look at those things we just listed out. Would you take a moment just to examine your own heart and life and consider how is God leading you to do justice in a world of abortion. And God, show us right now, we pray, how you are leading us to work on behalf of children in the womb and the precious women made in your image who are carrying them, the men alongside them. God, help us to know how to do justice in a world of abortion and lead us even right now to think through what that looks like practically in our lives? Are you leading some of us to pursue foster care, to pursue adoption, to pursue justice in, in so many different ways? God, speak to us now, we pray. Take a moment just to reflect, listen to him, and then I'll come back and lead us in prayer.
Oh God, we praise you for knitting each of us together in our mother's wombs, the way you've fearfully and wonderfully formed us. And so we just pray that you would help us to work on behalf of every single person you're forming in that way right now and in the days to come. And to do that in addition to working on behalf of moms who are carrying those children and whom you're doing this work and dads who are part of your plan in this whole picture. God, help us. Help us to do justice for the next generation, even the generation yet unborn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, before we finish this session and then take a break and go into our last session tonight, I, I want to speak just very specifically to each of you, to all of us together, as we're about to have some time in prayer again for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. As we think about the opportunity you and I have to hold the rope for them as they are on the front lines of urgent spiritual and physical need, proclaiming the gospel, and the opportunity we have, what a position by God's grace for us to be in, to be able to use his grace in our lives, resources he's given us to come alongside them on the other side of the world from where most of us are and to say, we're with you. We're holding the rope for you. You're not alone. And we wanna help equip you in all the ways we've, we've talked about already, equip you with the word and help you with microloans and, and, and basically just living there and working there and help you share the gospel and to plant churches and to meet needs with the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus, the opportunity we have through our praying right now before our Father on behalf of our brothers and sisters and then through our giving. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's, let's show that our hearts are with them by putting treasure toward them. I just, I want to personally encourage you to ask God, how is he leading you to give, to come alongside our brothers and sisters there and to put that into practice? What an opportunity we have to do that right now. So I wanna, I wanna pray for us and let my praying for us lead us into specific time in prayer we get together with a couple other people and there'll be specific things on the screen that we can pray for. And, and then during this break, as God has put it on your heart, let's give generously and sacrificially and cheerfully to come alongside our brothers and sisters on the front lines of urgent spiritual and physical need and let them know their family is with them. So Heavenly Father, we pray right now on behalf of our brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters, who you see and know far better than we do. We say before you, Father, we love them and we wanna intercede for them right now. And we know that this prayer time we're about to enter into, we're starting right now, is it's not in vain that you, our Father, have called us to this, that you hear us, that you will answer according to what we ask, according to your word. So hear our prayers now, our cries in all these places where we're gathered on their behalf. And God, we pray that you would show us in our minds and our hearts how you are leading us with the grace you've given to us to come alongside them, to support them, to give in order to show them our love for them, support of them, and our desire to see more and more Afghans brought into the family through our praying and our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. So get together with a couple other people around you and start praying according to these points you see on the screen, and then let's give accordingly.
Padre, hay tantas cosas asombrosas que podemos decir, pero la que más nos asombra a nosotros es que podemos decirte, Padre, we can call you Father, and for that we give you thanks. Thank you for listening to our prayers. Thank you for being there for us at every moment in our lives. And thank you for not only listening to our prayers, but in Christ you are praying for us. And I want to pray for the people of Afghanistan together and ask that you show kindness to them, to the country, to those that are in need right now. We pray, Lord, that you show your favor to them. In particular, Lord, I want to pray. I want to pray with my brothers and sisters here that you show your favor to those that know you and that are struggling right now. I pray for the believing fathers and the believing mothers there, that you show them grace and help them um, be, criar a tus hijos e hijas en la amonestación y la gracia del Señor. Give them the right words, the right ways to show you, to show them the scriptures, uh, to lead their children in the, the way of the Lord. Señor, nosotros oramos juntos que tú les ayudes, eh, no solamente en la crianza y en la disciplina, sino también que tú les ayudes, Señor, a mostrar amor y a mostrar gracia a su alrededor. I also pray, Lord, with my brothers and sisters here, for those of us that have means, that you will move our hearts to help, whether it is by going or by sending. Lord, there are so many of us that have been blessed in so many ways. I, I am comfortable here where I am. So I pray, Lord, that you move our hearts to help and to send. Lord, you are a good God, and you are worthy of our lives. So please, Lord, help us live our lives for you, because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are at the end of session two. Take a breath. We've gotten a lot accomplished tonight. We've dug into the scriptures. We've explored the doctrine of the image of God and some of the identity issues we face today. We've also spent necessary time in prayer for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. And now if you've been sitting this whole time, now's really the time to stand up, stretch your legs a little bit, do some jumping jacks, get some cardio in, do that. But before you do, we want to encourage you to consider giving to our Hold the Rope offering. As we've seen, the situation for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan is dire. But with your help, we can equip Bible-believing, Jesus-professing Christians to plant churches, care for refugees, provide for their families, and rekindle the fire for the gospel in Afghanistan. Again, you can give by scanning the QR code on screen with your phone or by visiting radical.net slash secret church impact. This portal is going to be open all the way through May 31st. So if you'd like to give even after the event is over, you can do that. Lastly, we're excited to share that we partnered with the Gospel Coalition to release a special narrative podcast following the story of what happened to the church in Afghanistan when the Taliban took over. You can find a link to that episode on our website as well. All right, that's all for now. We'll see you in session.